It's Friday, December 4th. That means it's number 48, our episode of the Zogby Report, Real and Unscripted. Every week, those of you who've been watching know that I, John Zogby, and my son, Jeremy Zogby, take a look at the news, the polling numbers, whatever is out there, no fear of controversy whatsoever, and oftentimes different points of view, and we get into it spontaneously, which I think is the, the key word for what we do. How are you doing this week? I'm fine. How about you? I'm doing well. And so if we can still call this spontaneous, I had a couple of ideas on the way as I was parking the car. And so I'm going to lay out the two big questions that I'd like to deal with today and then open it up to everybody and welcome their comments through the week. So question number one is going to be, uh, how will Do Donald Trump be viewed in history? We'll take a first cut at that because obviously historical events uh, will change and points of view will change down the road. So how will Donald Trump be viewed in history? And I'll take a swing at that uh, shortly. The second question is, it's December. That means that Time Magazine, which has been selecting a man of the year and then person of the year now for many decades, um, is uh, right now considering who that person or persons will be. And so let's start thinking about that one, and we'll ask it everyone else to share their thoughts with a reason why. So uh, do you want to take the first swing at Donald Trump or do you want me to? It was your idea, so. All right. Okay, so I, uh, by way of context, I take the, uh, the ranking of presidents very seriously, monitoring it all the time. And I love to watch the changes that take place. I also love to watch um, what happens with the more recent presidents. And so by way of context, never a disagreement about the top three, George, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, and Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's number four, and very interestingly, and I've seen this over the years, these are the rankings by historians, number five is Dwight Eisenhower. He was number 20 at one time, and I'll tell you, because uh, I'll talk about Ike for a second, that Ike uh, was uh, viewed as number 20 way back when because almost all of the historians that were ranking him were liberal historians. Ike, of course, was a uh, Republican, more moderate uh, conservative Republican. But uh, Ike jumped up. He kept us out of war with Russia. Uh, the highway system was a, a premier investment. Started out as a military idea in defense, but it became really the way of linking all of the states. And then civil rights, the Civil Rights Act in 1957, the desegregation uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Those are just to mention a few. Interestingly, some of the recent presidents I've seen climb a bit too. And so into the next tier, um, 11, 12, 13, 14, you find uh, Lyndon Johnson, um, Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama, which is uh, very uh, interesting, and of course Ronald Reagan. Going to be fascinating to me to see what sort of movement takes place. I wonder if Barack Obama stays that high um, uh, over the years. I wonder if Ronald Reagan survives the, that test too. Uh, by way of context, down on the bottom, no argument about these. The, the, the worst is James Buchanan, who did nothing uh, to prevent the Civil War. And then right in that period squeezed his predecessor Franklin Pierce and um, Millard Fillmore. Uh, these are all guys who, who really either proactively helped to foment the Civil War or do nothing to prevent it. Also in that crowd, Warren Harding, um, seen by, by most people as a, a failure. 
Uh, for those who may wonder about other recent presidents, Jimmy Carter has had sort of a rebirth um, and moved from the high 30s to the low 30s, as has, incidentally, George W. Hmm. Bush moved into the, like 33 or 34, whereas he was at, uh, th you know, also 38 or 39. I'm going to say that despite accomplishments that uh, Donald Trump may have made, we'll see how it's viewed later on, but when the first vote is taken, I think you're going to see Donald Trump somewhere around where James Buchanan among yes. the worst. Among the worst. Uh, some of that will be the bias of historians, to be sure, but I think it's all about deportment. Uh, maybe the uh, good student in class, acceptable student in class with some accomplishment, but one who maybe disrupted and caused a little too much uh, trouble and did not get along well uh, with, with other kids. So. Out of um, uh, 45 presidencies, 44 men who have been president, I'm going to put Donald Trump, and I keep Buchanan where he was, I'm going to put Donald Trump at about 43. What do you think? Got a lot of names here. Um, and of course, it's no surprise to you that, that I'm a big fan of, of history, but particularly revisionist history. Um, and, and not just one approach to revision, but the, the top three, and I have heard that consistently. It, to me, it makes sense, George Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he, he, he set the, the precedent for two terms. This guy was, was loved by many. He could have, uh, some say that you know, he could have been president for the rest of his life. And, and a significant portion of the country would have gone with it. But, but he set the precedent. He stepped down. Um, he gave a farewell address, and he gave us the two biggest warnings that, that mm -hmm. we Absolutely. still to this day need to adhere to is the foreign involvement mm -hmm. as well as the, the factions of political parties. The foreign involvement, George Washington understood that as a republic, uh, a, a, a nation based on the rule of law and a nation based on, on freedom, you, you could not be an empire. And then at the same time, maintain your republic at home. The two were, were uh, antithetical. And then, of course, we know that uh, you know, a nation uh, warring with each other in, in terms of politics and words is devastating. And that still lives with us today. Abraham Lincoln and FDR, you know, I take an interesting approach to I know that. I do. And, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, from a human rights perspective, uh, and, and by human rights, I, I, I mean just broadly speaking, human life. Mm -hmm. um, FDR, as we all know, uh, was dictatorial. I, I see FDR in the, as a man of the times. Mm -hmm. The decades of the 20s and the 30s gave rise to, to fascism and communism and, and forms of centralized government that the world had never seen. You know, Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, uh, Mussolini, Franco. And although America has this tradition of, you know, uh, freedom and, and limited government, FDR fits neatly in that, not as extreme, because he put into uh, prison camps the Japanese Americans. We forget that, you know, of course, much more extreme what Hitler was doing with, with the, the, the Gestapo and rounding up the Jews and, and, and putting them in, um, in, in these prison labor death camps. Now, although FDR didn't sentence Japanese to death, they were put in prison uh, camps. For what? Because they were second and third um, uh, generation Japanese Americans. Um, you know, of course, then there, there are other uh, dictatorial things that you can get into that FDR did and you know you could say that it was a wartime presidency so he had those uh, executive uh, uh, powers but I mean think about imprisoning uh, hundreds of thousands of people rounding them up um, and, and not Germans and Italians and and not Germans and Italians so although there was in, race there in uh, exactly although in Canada I recently learned they did that to uh, to Italians 
they, they rounded up the Italians in, in Canada. I, I learned that from a Canadian. Um, so that's that's FDR. Now, Abe, I take a similar approach. Um, and, and what I say is that why is America the only nation that had to shed blood over 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 slavery every other country peacefully eventually peacefully abolished slavery and the argument is is that industrialization was was on its way and it there was just no way that slavery could compete with industrialization it was so archaic it was it was so inhumane that eventually it just would have fallen by the wayside because of the forces of industrialization. Because in every other nation, that's what happened. You know, England, Spain, Portugal, every other nation that, that had a major slave trade peacefully gave it up. America was the only one where 700,000 people had to die. And we know that Lincoln's purpose of freeing the slaves was not because he cared about them. Lincoln was a white supremacist. Lincoln said himself he had no intention of the white and the black race to intermingle. In fact, he detested that idea. So I mean, he would, in, in, in this view, Lincoln is a political opportunist, and, um, and, and the bloodshed of 700,000 uh, Americans could have been avoided if he just let the South go ahead and secede, and the South would have sowed its own seeds of destruction because they would not have been able to, to compete with the forces of industrialization. So I'm just going to interrupt for one second. Hold that thought. Okay. Okay. I'm going to leave FDR alone. We're just going to say that you and I disagree mm -hmm. on FDR. Uh, the point you made about slavery, I think economically is sound. Yeah. And it really had nowhere to expand and as an economy, it was a dying economy. On the other hand, an infrastructure, uh, a culture was built around slavery, a culture that permanently enslaved blacks, whether they were technically free or not, yeah. uh, and discriminated against them. So we have from Jim Crow uh, 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 to separate but equal and, and, and a welfare system and so on. And so, I'm going to take exception and say that while the economic institution may have uh, may have died, that the the, uh, the southern culture that was dependent on racism and a slave master slave mentality was not going to go by the wayside, and eventually there would have to be a reckoning. In fact, uh, I think we're well into part three or part four of that reckoning. Mm. We still haven't resolved it. But um, anyway, no, that that that's that's an interesting point. I just raised the question in every other society where, where slavery was was a major practice, like I named the colonial powers. Yeah, uh, no doubt about it. Were they less racist than the Americans? I, I don't see how we could make the argument that American slavery was 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 worse than, you know, the, the Portuguese, worse than the, what the English did to their subjects around the world, worse than what the French did. And, and the net, you know, the Dutch and so on, and the Spanish. Um, so I, I, I don't, I, yes, there was a culture that was built around it, but it, it, it would have been pinned into submission. And, and look, the North was still racist, right? Oh, absolutely. They wanted, no, they wanted nothing to do with, I mean, the it, blacks were, were segregated in the northern cities, perhaps even more so. It just wasn't written in the law. Here's the cliche, and to, uh, to a great degree, it's true. The cliche is, in the South, this is white people talking about blacks. In the South, we don't care how high you rise. No, mm -hmm. we don't care uh, how close you are. Just don't rise up. In the North, we don't care how high you rise up; just don't get close. Yeah. So. Yeah. But let's move on to the president. Well, hey, I just I I'm sorry. I I, I, I still want to go go through all these things. Um, as far as um, yeah, there's an interpretation of the Civil War that it 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 we tend to see it that that it was it was about slavery and no doubt about it, slavery was at the forefront. But there was much more to it. My interpretation of the Civil War is that. This, this is that still that, that, that backdrop to American history of the forces of, of Jeffersonian principles and Hamiltonian principles. 
decentralization versus centralization, and that in, in, in essence, Lincoln was following in the tradition of Hamilton in wanting a, a, a strongly centralized, powerful federal government. And my interpretation is that the North really wanted to reshape the South in its, its image of industry, and that it, it wanted to dominate the South uh, as opposed to just let it fall apart on its own. Uh, anyway, to, m moving on, um, Eisenhower, I like Eisenhower because of his, his farewell speech and mm -hmm. warning of the military, military. And industrial complex. Um, Warren G. Harding is interesting because we all know about the, the Teapot Dome scandal, but what we don't hear about is the Depression of 1920 and 21. Mm -hmm. We're following World War One, right? 1919, the Treaty of Versailles. You know, after the, just think about. I mean, really, anytime there's a, a large-scale warfare, there's going to be a recession or a depression that follows, because of all that you know misallocation of of of, of capital and all of that massive spending. Uh, it tends to have that economic downturn. Well, the the depression of twenty and twenty one occurred after uh, the conclusion of World War One, and it went away in a year and a half because Warren G. Harding uh, is is credited as having done nothing, having not intervened and letting the bad economic decisions play out and recuperate, essentially, you know, like when, when somebody's physically ill, that the, the notion of economic intervention really only exacerbates the problem. And that's how we get the roaring 20s, is there's more inter, intervention throughout the 20s, and that's what leads to, to the 29 bust. And I'll say that's a wrap for, for that question. Let me add for, something about Harding, though. Harding did something that FDR never did. He spoke out uh, uh, against lynching and supported anti-lynching legislation in Congress. FDR, because Southern leadership, Southern Democrats were an essential part of the New Deal coalition, FDR never did that. And, and that's true, and, and many African Americans felt that while, while it was being called the New Deal, they felt it was the raw deal. Raw deal. Mm -hmm. Oh, Donald Trump. So I don't know where Donald Trump is, is going to go. What, what I'm fascinated by is before there was the Trump phenomenon, we remember the Tea Party. Yes. The Tea Party came about because of, I, I think largely because of the Pauls. Ron Paul and Rand Paul were a driving force of the Tea Party. And then other people like Palin and, and other people got involved. And, and, and hardcore Tea Partiers think that the movement was derailed. And um, it got kind of... Uh, taken over by mainstream conservatism when it was really started by this, you know, Rand, Rand and Ron, the, the libertarians. But people need to realize that, and this is my thesis, that uh, Trump took what was already, you know, not being harnessed, the, the, the leftovers of the Tea Party, the anger that's just not going to disappear overnight. And I, I think the, the Trump movement really just swallowed that up and so mm -hmm. now you know i mean come january 20th right and biden is is going to be president and and what is trump going to do is is he going to be literally kicked out uh, kicking and screaming or is he just going to walk away um where's that movement going to go those 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 70 plus million people my question is more importantly than where is trump going to uh, fall in, in terms of rankings of presidents who's going to usurp that movement is he going to step back enough to let somebody usurp that movement? I think that's it. Where does Trump go? Because Trump is good for 73 million votes, 47 percent and counting of the, um, of the electorate, 47 percent of a very high electorate. So give me a number from 1 to 44. I'm not. I'm not copping out. Uh, the the rankings aren't important. I I mean, per se. Okay, I don't really see too many modern. I don't think that modern presidents belong mm -hmm. in in the the mix of of high rankings. High rankings is in a good president, because the modern presidency is an imperial presidency. So I would not put uh, from Reagan or even Carter. Uh, by my estimation, I, I think JFK might be, JFK and Eisenhower are the 
most recent presidents that should go as as a high ranking. I think everybody after after that has just been an imperial president. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> um, I'm time gonna, person. Yeah, but let me encourage people at this point to please write to us and give us a number and why. Um, the greatest, near great, average, near the bottom, at the very bottom. I'm a bottom guy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, times, person, or persons of the year. So, I had all of about three minutes to think about it. Uh, initially, uh, and I know you're going to disagree with this. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> initially, um, uh, Anthony Fauci. Uh, now, I'm trying to think like time, you know, who has had the greatest impact? Um, th we say globally, but on, the, on, on, on Americans. And I think he's probably the most trusted, most trusted person in healthcare, most trusted person in medicine, and probably symbolic of um, during a, a, a very difficult period who was the one person who was trusted the most. But then as I thought about it, I thought that uh, it could be a compromise of some sort where Fauci's face is on the cover as a representative of those healthcare workers nationwide who are on the front lines and are battling the, the worst crisis, worst epidemic in, in over 100 years. And so I'm gonna say uh, Anthony Fauci and the essential frontline uh, medical work, healthcare workers. The healthcare industry. The healthcare, healthcare workers. Healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's your, yeah. That's, that's your who time. I think they will choose. Okay. You know, it, it, I, I'm sure this was a nationwide phenomenon, but when you drive around this area, you see you see a lot of signs. Thank you, essential workers. It started to break my heart that I saw that sign, those signs, because I, I was thinking, you know, what if, what if I was fired or furloughed or laid off? Mm. And here I am, not sure about what my future is, and I see somebody basically telling me, you're not essential. Mm -hmm. That breaks my heart. I think I found the answer in listening to you. I, if, it, if, if it were left up to me, or because I don't know who's going to be, but if it were left up to me, I think the small entrepreneur, I think the small business owner, because look at what they've had to go through in terms of the uncertainty. There are those who, who are still hanging on by threads. There are some of those who are actually thriving, um, but we've seen so many millions of businesses uh, terminated, gone, maybe gone forever, and you've got these small business owners that are hanging on for their lives. And um, I think I think they're just as essential. Essential and survivors. Survivors. Okay. All right, that's interesting. So let's just rule in or rule out possibilities. So Joe Biden, over 80 million votes, and he won the presidency, I will say clearly and, and unequivocally. Does he get a vote? Does he get a consideration? Remember, your Time Magazine. You're and not Joe prob Probably, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure he's he's going to be to to be considered. Okay. Um, let's go worldwide. There's nothing jumping out at me except Bill Gates. Bill Gates, who's, uh, but what did he? What happened this year that? Demarcates. He told everybody back in 2016 that during the, the Trump presidency there was going to be a pandemic. Okay, all right. So Bill Gates, uh, Putin. I don't or, know that that necessarily qualifies as time person of the year, but. Uh, so Vladimir Putin um, is uh, uh, the leader of an expansionist and global power, Russia. Mm. Um, President Xi clearly is the president of an expansionist, growing imperial uh, global power. Um, Did, didn't Putin get it? 
in the last five to ten he years? He did. Yeah. He did. I, honestly, I can't remember when, but yes. Uh, you know, to be honest, it's good or bad. Uh, Hitler was uh, was Time's Man of the Year. Yeah. I believe right. in 1933. Yes. But you'll have to check that. I'm not sure. You know, he, he was in the 30s. Um, well, it, it's, it's an interesting thought. Um, now, Donald Trump, because he dominated the news almost every single day until I would say um, he and everybody else's mind lost the election. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would be surprised if, if uh, he got the... the I would too. <laughs> I would too. But I, I think I think you're probably in the right direction with... Uh, with Put it this way, if he got that, uh, we would ask for a recount. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we would. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd want to see the evidence. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, Okay, uh, Dr. Fauci and healthcare workers, uh, surviving uh, entrepreneurs. Yes. Okay, I think that's a good note uh, to end on. So we're asking you, and then I'd like to read your comments um, next week. Yeah, you can write to my dad, John at johnsogbystrategies.com. You can write to me, Jeremy at johnsogbystrategies.com. You can go to the website, www.johnsogbystrategies.com, and and leave a, a comment in the uh, con- contact us button. So sure. really, please do it. And we welcome criticism because even if we didn't, we get it anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Next week, we'll read your comments. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks.